My name is Jessica Lee, and I'm a senior research fellow at the Quincy Institute. I'm here with my colleague, Sarang Shidori, to discuss South Korea's recent presidential election, tensions on the Korean Peninsula and between U.S. and China, as well as President Biden's recent meeting with South Korea's new president, Yoon suk yeol Though China was not mentioned by name in the joint statement that ensued between Biden and Yoon, the United States likely wants President Yoon to take a tougher approach to China in line with U.S.'s Indo-Pacific strategy. Sarang and I published a paper that explained why pushing South Korea toward an anti-China containment strategy could backfire and harm U.S. interests in the region. We also identified sources of dissent and division that exist within South Korean elite, as well as the public. So what's your sense of the divisions within South Korea on China and also the fact that Yoon's mandate is not very strong, that he won with a thin majority? How does that how is that going to impact uh, uh, South Korea's alignments? Yeah, as you noted, Sarang, it was a very contentious and close election. Uh, and I think it was important in the ways it revealed deep divisions uh, and ambivalence uh, within the South Korean public about what a f- uh, future uh, post Moon Jae-in administration ought to look like. You know, while foreign policy, much like in the U.S., wasn't a top issue uh, during the presidential campaign, Yoon suk yeols victory uh, is, is quite consequential, given uh, some of the language that we saw during uh, the presidential campaign uh, that he used to describe China and its, uh, uh, the threats uh, facing South Korea. And so I do think that because we also uh, uh, have to understand that there is a danger uh, of Washington overlooking uh, some of the nuances and fissures of South Korean politics, that we ought to be really careful about what uh, constitutes South Korean interests when it comes to China, uh, and more importantly, what U.S. interests in the region uh, should guide uh, in terms of its own strategy to its ally. Uh, But there are also signs that China may not necessarily be the focal point Uh, in terms of U.S.-South Korea relations, at least in the last few days of the UN administration that we've been able to see to date, which is, I think, really good uh, from the point of view of U.S. interests in the Korean Peninsula. So, uh, Sarang, I wanted to turn to you and and ask you a question, which is, you know, to get your thoughts on the Biden administration's Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, Yes, so the Indo-Pacific strategy of the Biden administration builds on the previous strategies by the Trump administration. Indeed, it's a continuation. Uh, Having deeper or building deeper ties with U.S. allies and partners in Asia. Now, that's a good thing should have better relations with all the countries in Asia uh, that uh, helps the United States in multiple ways, including uh, economically. Uh, On the flip side, though, the Indo-Pacific strategy uh, talks of improving these relations with allies and partners for a very specific purpose. And the purpose is to counter and even arguably contain China. Uh, The strategy speaks of Uh, much greater military-to-military cooperation, uh, transforming what traditionally was a hub-and-spoke alliance system in Asia uh, to a much more unified sort of a front against China. It talks of developing advanced war-fighting capabilities with allies and partners. Uh, It also refers to a concept called integrated deterrence, which is a sort of a multi-level deterrent strategy. Again, China is not mentioned by name, but the target is very clear. So China has become the organizing principle of U.S. strategy in Asia. I want to now turn to the Quad, which is another major issue of interest between the United States and South Korea and, of course, to the region. How does this issue, in your mind, fit within the U.S.-South Korea relations and President Yoon's policy toward China? So the the Quad is a four-country grouping that has had two lives. So the first life was, uh, it started in 2007 and then sort of didn't go anywhere. Uh, The second incarnation of the Quad emerges in 2017. And, uh, but the goals are sort of similar. Uh, The idea is for four U.S. allies and partners, which is the United States, Japan, Australia, and India, to come together to counter China, although again, this is not explicit, that is very much the agenda of the court. So one area of action is non-traditional security, but also not officially owned is a military dimension of the court, such as the Malabar exercise, which is 
uh, annual between the same four countries and has been growing in its sophistication uh, with very clear and explicit types of exercises intended to counter China, anti-submarine warfare, interdiction, and those sorts of things. So here the expectation has been from the U.S., again, not explicitly shouted from the rooftops, but it's been that other countries in Asia start associating with the Quad. And South Korea, in fact, joined such an associated event. During the pandemic, there was a meeting of Quad Plus countries, what were dubbed as Quad Plus, which included uh, South Korea. And, but they talked only about the pandemic and the health crisis. They did not talk about security. So you can see the dynamic at work where there is a preference uh, in Washington to expand the Quad in terms of associations and there are some lines being drawn by the Asian partners and allies on how far they can go. And President Yoon's public pledge during his campaign to associate with the Quad, although he's, he's, he's not going to join it, and the U.S. has said that South Korea is not going to join the Quad, but nevertheless, associating more with the Quad is on the cards. Uh, the allies and partners especially understand that they live next to China, and they don't want to put themselves at risk. And in the case of South Korea, as we just talked about, there are deep divisions. There is not a consensus on this in the country. That's exactly right. I think, um, you know, what we're seeing, too, is that uh, because, uh, as you noted, uh, there are such strong uh, economic ties between China and South Korea, that any kind of radical shift in its China policy will put South Korea at great risk. Uh, keep in mind that China is South Korea's largest trading partner. Uh, and over a quarter of South Korea's total trade is with China, which totals more than its trade with U.S. and Japan combined. You know, it does seem that uh, it is in uh, South Korea's interest uh, to, uh, to be cautious. You know, South Korea, I think, uh, as we noted, is, is far uh, from united. Uh, there is no consensus uh, in terms of how to approach China. That does make sense, I think, for uh, South Korea and the United States to move cautiously. So uh, to wrap up, I would love to uh, highlight some of the policy recommendations that we touched on in the paper, Saran. Could you walk us through some of the um, recommendations? Sure. Uh, we both worked on this and came up with a set of recommendations that we think are in the national interests of the United States, that this will make the United States-South uh, Korea alliance healthier. Uh, it will reduce the risk of South Korea drifting away from the United States. And indeed, as you mentioned, uh, Jessica, risks of a blowback by a president who then reacts in a very negative fashion to, to the sorts of uh, preferences that, uh, that cannot be sustained. The first uh, and the most important thing in terms of uh, policy prescriptions is a broader mega point, which is about not seeing South Korea as a part of an overall China containment strategy. That is not a sustainable uh, way to go about it. Uh, and specifically, it also means that the United States should not try to push South Korea uh, into joining these emerging, non-inclusive, block-like structures that the U.S. is building up in the region, the Quad being the most obvious one in the case of South Korea. But separate from South Korea, there's also AUKUS, which involves Australia. The third uh, recommendation that uh, we have in our brief is to also be more cautious on trying to push South Korea on deploying these THAAD anti-missile defense systems. The additional battery that is to be deployed uh, is in a region where the local uh, protests are strong. And again, there is not a consensus within South Korea on this issue as well. So the United States should wait till such a consensus evolves in the country before trying to push that deployment. The last two points that we suggested was to rethink the alliance with South Korea. Now, of course, the core goal for the alliance is uh, to achieve stability and peace on the Korean peninsula. North Korea is a threat, and the South Korea-US alliance is focused on trying to bring down that level of threat and to create some kind of a, a diplomatic, eventually a diplomatic uh, path out of, out, of the, out of the situation. But if South Korea is to be seen uh, as a partner beyond the peninsula, it should be seen as a bridge uh, in the United States' dealings with China. South Korea is a country that has good relations with China. It, of course, is an ally of the U.S., and that gives the U.S. an opportunity 
given the fraught tensions and poor relations with China, there is a need for channels of communication, pathways of engagement with Beijing. South Korea can act as one such uh, pathway. Uh, and finally, looking at the Quad in, in a more bottom-up fashion, think of it as much more as a, as a means to gain U.S. influence through delivering public goods in a more efficient and faster way to the region, but not alienating the region or indeed creating challenges for the United States uh, with its partnerships and alliances by trying to militarize the Quad.